I got an email from a guy and he said, hi, Jeff, my name's Jerome and I've never worn a helmet in my life. He said, because they're too cumbersome and I don't want to carry one around all day. He said, but then I came across Morpha and I thought, what a great idea. So I bought one. And he said, it came about two weeks ago and I've just had the most terrible accident. I can't remember what happened, but I'm in hospital. And there was a picture of him with his face all cut up to bits, his chin and his face all cut. I didn't see at the time, but he also had a broken arm. And he said, uh, I had a terrible accident and your helmet most definitely saved my life. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast. I am your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for listening. You're listening to episode 23. Jeff Wolf and his invention, the Morpher Helmet. This episode is the second part of a three-part series. The Invention Stories podcast is brought to you by the Socket Saver. Do you have loose wall sockets in your house? The Socket Saver is an easy, safe, and effective solution. More information can be found at www.socketsaver.com. This Invention Stories podcast episode is a Skype interview, and at times Jeff is sharing with me the details of the Morpher Helmet. We've got Jeff Wolf on the line, so let's get back to it. You know, Jeff, it seems like the Morpher helmet would be great for lots of different, uh, not just bicyclists, but... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we're developing one at the moment for snow sports, because that's obviously a big one. Snow sports is huge, where people should wear helmets, but they find them cumbersome. Um, and it's not just snow sports. We're looking at military versions. You know, you take a soldier in, I don't know, Iraq or somewhere where it's hot, They've got to have a helmet with them, and but they can't keep them on their belt because they're too bulky, so they keep them on their head, which means they're hot all the time, and they hate their helmets for that reason. And they only really need them when they're under fire. So it's a real kind of anti-air conditioning. They can't, you know, they've got they've got this hot thing on their head. So we're developing a lightweight Kevlar bulletproof version. Wow. We're trying. Children, obviously, we're developing children's. Have you seen the helmet? Uh, well, just on the video, I haven't seen it in my hands. It's okay. really awesome how it opens and closes. Where are you based, by the way? Which I, I'm in Morrill Bay, which is next to San Luis Obispo. I went to San Luis Obispo. No, not to the prison. I mean, <laughs> I drove once from L.A. to San Francisco. We went past San Luis Obispo. That's the big prison there, isn't there? Big jail. There's a men's colony here, but yeah. uh, there's a bigger prison up near Soledad. But Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the greatest. I'm, I'm looking at. I'm looking at it. It's it's such a well, this beautiful is it. design. This is it, and it is. It's really. It's that quick. I'm so happy with it now. It's. Ta- I mean, it has taken forever to get it right, and a lot of heartache, and a lot of people trying to rip me. Oh, it's just been. It's been murder. Been murder. But there it is. There you go. And uh, and it's got this really quite groovy thing underneath this. Um, this lock that just does just does that. Yeah, I saw that, and that's one of the things I was going to ask you about. And the design is, is used yeah. like magnets, and yeah, yeah, I'd never heard of that. No, there's quite a few magnets in here. So when I close it, I basically, I just go there and there, and it just shuts. So it's it's less than a second to close, and a, you know, a second or two to open that fast, and it's open, ready to use. So that's how quickly it opens. And that's how quickly it shuts. I mean, yes, I sort of understand it well, so I'm, <laughs> I'm fast at it. But to, uh, anyone does that very quickly. It's very, very quick and easy. And that's what I saw in the reviews. They were like, yeah, this is really great. I mean, I, oh, you I, see, I, there's no downside to it. It's beautiful. Oh, you're so kind. That's really nice of you to say. You know, I still get this feeling. I still always have the, It's mad. When I see someone new with it, I always get this little fear. They're going to say, well, hang on. It doesn't work. What's, you know doesn't work very well. What's so special about that? But actually, everyone I see doesn't do that. It's really nice. Everyone I see is really positive about it. Yeah, it must be nice getting feedback like, hey, I really love this. It's really changed my life and and I use it. And you've probably got people tell you that they've been in accidents and 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 have worn it and maybe they wouldn't have. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, now I'm going to tell you a story. I always said 
to journalists or to anyone, I always said, look, it's been a real horrible hassle. But if I save even one life, it's going to have all been worth it. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It's not some marketing spin. I, I, I really mean that. Now, about four weeks ago, I got an email from a guy and he said, hi, Jeff, my name's Jerome and I've never worn a helmet in my life. He said, because they're too cumbersome and I don't want to carry one around all day. He said, but then I came across Morpha and I thought, what a great idea. So I bought one. And he said, it came about two weeks ago and I've just had the most terrible accident. I can't remember what happened, but I'm in hospital. And there was a picture of him with his face all cut up to bits, his chin and his face all cut. I didn't see at the time, but he also had a broken arm. And he said, uh, I had a terrible accident and your helmet most definitely saved my life. He said, the doctors have told me that I can't use it anymore because it's been a bit crushed. So I'm going to save up for another one. So I got straight back to him. I said, well, firstly, Jerome, thank God you're alive, blah, blah, blah. Of course, you're not going to save up for another one. I'll send you one with pleasure. Tell me more about you. Because by then I'd figured because he said he was going to save up. I thought maybe he's a school kid. It was hard to tell from his picture. Anyway, he came back to me. He still didn't tell me his age at that point. He said, that's really lovely of you. I just want you to be absolutely to know for sure that it definitely saved my life. And I definitely would have been wearing, wouldn't have been wearing one. So I said, now I need your address so I can, this was my next email. I'd like your address because I want to send you a helmet. And I expected he'd be in New York somewhere because most, or or sorry, in the States somewhere, because most of our people are from the States. And lo and behold, his address was in Zurich. And I was flying the very next day to Zurich because I was going to Eurobike. This is only a few weeks ago. So I went back to him. I said, I can't believe you're in Zurich. I'm going to be flying to Zurich airport tomorrow, place I would never go, by the way. I'm going to go to Zurich airport tomorrow. So I think this is ordained or, you know, so I said, let me come and see you and give you the helmet. So he said, sure. So I went to see him and his mother and he's He's 17. He's about two weeks younger than my daughter, who's also 17. He'll be 18 in in, uh, January. And I saw this lovely, lovely guy who told me the whole story of his accident. And I think we did save his life because he went flying into a curbstone. And you can see the mark on the helmet where it corresponds to the marks on his face. And um, I was so moved. It was such an emotional meeting. And his mother was just delightful and so happy that he had the helmet and i gave him a brand new helmet and he's really happy and i'm really happy and i said to him i wasn't going to use any of this i said i didn't feel it was right to use it for press because it was a very personal you know and he said no i want you to i want you to use it as much as possible i want you to get maximum press for this i'll even be your spokesman you have to shout about how this helmet saved my life blah 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 so i've got to tell you it was the most amazing most amazingly moving time for me still is moving when i think about it it's a lovely kid and you know he's only alive because of because of morpha which is really amazing kind of a little dizzy listening to that. yeah that is that yeah. is that is awesome to know that you've created a product that Absolutely. even worse maybe that the kid may have not been killed they may may be alive and be have brain damage or yeah you know, and absolutely. we don't even want to talk about that that's even worse sometimes than you know that's even you know there are they don't talk a lot about traumatic brain injury but the stats are awful and frightening and uh, you often see statistics for bicycles and they're split into injuries and deaths but the injuries includes a huge number of traumatic brain injuries where people are reduced to like a vegetative state they're a burden on their family for the next 40 years you know they can't do anything they can't look after themselves i mean it's it's really a fate almost i don't want to say it's worse than death but you you know what i mean sure it's uh i wanted to say that i've been in different environments and like when i used to live in phoenix which is super hot uh yeah. nobody rides their bikes there the only people that right. ride their bikes are definitely very very low income or they're they're recently uh, immigrants, yeah. typically. Yeah. And if you ever saw somebody ride a bike, you'd never see a helmet. Where I live here, it's a different environment. Like, everybody wears a helmet. Really? And then, like, like uh, for the first time, I went to Amsterdam. and Oh, yeah. I, you yeah. know, and, and, and no I way. was expecting the pot, and I was expecting the red light district and, and the, the canals and everything. What I was not expecting is, like, there is, like, a trillion... Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, do you know there's something like 
what is it? I think there's 2.2 bikes for every member of the population in <laughs> in uh, Holland. I mean, it, it's it's mad, but none of them wear helmets. I'm not. Everyone says to me, "Oh, you must sell them in Holland," but it's never going to happen because the whole infrastructure there is set up for cycling. They're big, heavy, slow bikes. They, they, they've got cycleways everywhere. The cars are used to bikes. You know, it's a it's a biker's paradise. Maybe one day, but not not in the short term. Yeah, as a tourist, it kind of caught me off guard. It was like, I got to watch and make sure I don't walk in those lanes because those guys are riding high speed. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It seems I like that's I, the goal of all the uh, big cities in Europe is to have more people riding bikes and, uh, you know, sort of alleviate the pressure on the, uh, on well, the cars. It's not, yeah, it's not just Europe. Bicycle sales have overtaken cars in the States and Europe now. But much more important, if you go on Wikipedia bicycle share schemes or bike share schemes, you'll see... Well, when I started this idea back in 2011, there were 350 bike share schemes in the world, I think. 350, I think is right. And now there's over a thousand. So it's like every self-respecting city in the world, whether it's Mexico City, where I was about to go, or San Francisco, or I don't know, obviously all the European cities, all the Asian cities, China's got more bike shares than anywhere else now i mean it's it's gone mad it's gone mad this world of bike shares and consequently i guess it's a part of the people being aware of the green you know the the green aspects of cycling how important that is for the the planet but also cost as well it's a lot cheaper than gas guzzling cars so but uh it's gone mad around the world everywhere and now it's time for commercial break The Invention Stories podcast is brought to you by The Socket Saver. Do you have loose wall sockets? The Socket Saver is an easy, safe, and effective solution. No repairs necessary, no circuit breakers involved, no electrical knowledge or mechanical skills required. Socket Savers are inexpensive, efficient, and portable. For more information, please visit www.socketsaver.com. I'm just thinking, let's say a third of the people in the world ride bikes, or and it's probably very conservative estimate. You've got the product that is the best helmet there is, hands down. I mean, you've got to and be the market is marketing. so huge. You've got to be doing my marketing, honestly. I mean, I, I think it's lovely, Robert, but, you know, there's a lot of people who won't necessarily think it's the best helmet. I, you know, it's certainly the easiest helmet. It's certainly, it's so easy to carry. So easy. And it is a great helmet. So, But getting from that to getting a lot of people to wearing them, you know, it's going to take a while. It feels very good to me that, you know, I'm in my late 50s now, and it's nice that I finally seem to have cracked into a market where I might I might be able to do well, hopefully, out of it. It's not just about that, but after a horrible divorce and all that stuff that many men go through by my age, not all of us, but many of us, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm sort of starting again at the moment. Well, do you think it's a generational thing? Like, there's states here in the United States where there's no helmet law for motorcycles, even today. For in fact, when I was a kid, well, you could that. ride a motorcycle without a helmet. And it seems like all the kids I see now wear helmets. They grow up wearing helmets. Like, that's an expected thing. Do you think it'll be just a natural progression as the years go by that just everybody will be wearing helmets? Or do you still think I it's do. something that needs to be educated? For me, when I was growing up, seatbelts were voluntary. And um, when they made them compulsory, there was a lot of kickback in the UK. A lot of people were really angry about it, refused to wear them, kept getting fined by the police. And, And what's happened now is, you know, and I think I was one of those people that hated the idea of having to wear a seatbelt. But now if I got in a car and didn't put a seatbelt on, I feel completely exposed and feels, oh, my God, like I'm going to go through the windscreen. It's an awful feeling. I could never consider getting in a car without a seatbelt. Now, I have a feeling that with a process of legislation in some cases and a process just of people becoming aware of the risks in other cases, I think that the same thing will happen with helmets. I mean, I I couldn't get on a motorbike without a helmet for a million pounds you know it would just feel all wrong would just feel dangerous even if the law said i don't need to wear a helmet and i guess for me now it's the same on a bicycle and i think once you've worn a helmet for a while it's the only way to go i also think probably 
sporting events like, you know, the Tour de France and all these other bicycle events, they always wear helmets. And it's required to wear a helmet. You know, it's a, I think all of these things will sink down slowly into the psyche of the American people, the world people eventually. And, you know, people will start wearing helmets. May not happen for five years, but I think it's going to happen more and more and more. And then I think it becomes exponential. I think the change starts, you get a kind of critical mass, and then everyone wants to wear a helmet. And there'll always be people that won't wear a helmet. There'll always be people who want to be a little bit more risk-taking. But I think that um, more and more people will wear helmets, and I think it's just already beginning to happen. You know, I think what differentiates yours is not only is it more practical than any other helmet because yours folds in half, mm -hmm. it, is that it's actually cool. Like, you could just walk just with cool. it on your hip. And, and I think <laughs> here in California, at least, yeah. it's... It's about the cool. I mean, that's 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 yeah. it. You you've you've mastered both. It's the practical aspects, meeting and Listen, cool. Listen, Robert, so, Robert. If ever you give up journalism, I really want you to come and work for me because we need someone like you. <laughs> <laughs> I just speak the truth. That's you know, being cool is is, is really important. But I, I yeah. wanted to ask you about the design because I, I and I know that you went through Grant or worked with Graham Brett from Therefore Design oh, yeah, Company, that's right. and, and that's, that's right. one of the top top. And I'm guessing you must have known him from before uh, with well, your experience. Yeah, I did. I knew Graham Brett way back from the uh, early 90s when I was doing Morpha. Uh, sorry, Micromap, because they designed the hinges on a product called the Scion, it, the Scion 3C. It was, it, it was an organizer, you know, in the days of PDAs, personal digital assistants, before we had these things. And it was a kind of organizer thing that had a very clever hinge. So I was, they quoted to do the work for me on, on Micromap, but I didn't actually use them for that, but they're very good at hinging. So when I, when it came around to this time around to looking for this, they were one of the first designers I visited and I liked what they came up with. You know, they could take my ideas and my little sketches and my little paper prototypes and actually turn them into a product. But it's been a long journey. Christ has been a long journey. <laughs> No, the uh, the the hinge. I could see that being a got to be almost the most important part of it. But another big part of it is the actual the foam and how you thought of it. I, I was reading that you, you you have them interlocked like like a dog's yeah, teeth. Yeah, I'll show you that in a minute. But there's also there's this bit. Now that bit, I don't know how clearly you can see, but if you see this red helmet, if you look in the middle here, can you see here and here? And here, they're kind of hinge points, right? But they're not really, what those things are, are actually, they're this point and this point and this point and this point. And this whole mechanism, which is very complicated and brilliantly designed, is incorporated within this. The only bits you see are those bits, because you can't see it from, you know, because it's molded within this. But so there's that going on. And then, yes, the... Let's try and talk about the dog tooth a bit. I don't know if you can quite see it. Hang on, let me see if I can enlarge this picture. Inside of here, can you see in there the kind of dog tooth arrangement at the bottom there? I don't know if... I, I do see it. Yeah, I, I, I do see a sort of, a, yeah, the dog tooth uh, arrangement. Yeah, they're kind of opposite bits, uh -huh. okay, that fold into each other. So really what's going on is... Actually, they showed this very well on that video that you saw. But if you if you think that you need about a little bit more than that much EPS, expanded polystyrene, to protect your head in the case of an accident, and then you double it up, you know, you've got a big, thick helmet. It's actually you need about two centimeters or two inches. So you've got a big, thick helmet. So what I've done is, rather than butt them together like that, it is this arrangement that means that they can go together like that. So you've got sort of something like that on your head rather than something flat, so that when it closes, they can close into each other, so you get a flatter. Is that making sense? Or it totally I... makes sense. You're... In fact, oh, I, I saw good. that on the video, but I was just wondering how you how it came to you. Were you looking oh. at a dog one day, and you just, it just, yes. delight? Yeah. Or... It was a kind of eureka moment. I was lying in bed, I think. Most stuff happens in the middle of the night, and I suddenly thought, oh, my God, what if they do it this way? You know, I just sort of, that's how my inventions happened. So I was trying to think of a way to do it, and it came up, and I thought, would that work? Would that work? And that's what we did. It did work. 
I just try and concentrate like mad when I'm working on an innovation. You know, the first innovation was, can we make a folding helmet? But then it was, how the hell can we do that? How can we actually do it? You've been listening to episode 23 of the Invention Stories podcast, Jeff Wolf and the Morpher Helmet Part 2. I want to thank Jeff for being our guest today. More information can be found at www.morpherhelmet.com. The Invention Stories podcast has been sponsored by The Socket Saver. Does the plug fall out of your wall socket while vacuuming, drying your hair, using a power tool, or recharging your electronic devices? The Socket Saver is an easy, safe, and effective solution. Please visit www.socketsaver.com. If you're an inventor who would like to be featured on the Invention Stories podcast, have a suggestion on how we can make this podcast better, or would like to become a sponsor, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to write a positive review for us on iTunes. An easy way to get there is to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash review. More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. Thank you very much for listening today, and please tell a friend.